In this video, I'm going to um, go through a pretty ordinary, uh, pretty typical kind of projectile motion example. Um, and so what is going to be happening here is we're going to imagine a cannon that is on a castle wall um, that is 20 meters tall. Um, and the cannon fires a cannonball at 100 meters per second um, in a direction 30 degrees above the horizontal. Okay, and the question we want to find is how far does the ball go? Okay, so um, I'm going to begin with a sketch. So we have, here's the castle wall, um, which is 20 meters tall. The cannon is going to fire a ball like this at 100 meters per second, and the angle here is 30 degrees. Okay. So what we want to know is after this ball lands, what is this distance that it went? Okay, so this is a very ordinary kind of example. So um, we want to do the same approach that we used in the last example, which is consider the X and Y motions separately and then um, see what we can figure out from those um, pieces of information. But this one's a little trickier because the velocity is now no longer just horizontal. So we have to think about um, what is the horizontal and vertical component of the velocity. So to do that, I'm going to draw a triangle. So um, along the hypotenuse of this triangle, we have the initial velocity, which is 100 meters per second. But we can split that into an x part and a y part. Okay, so um, we know this angle is 30 degrees. And so this side along the bottom is going to be 100 meters per second times cosine of 30 degrees. Um, and if that's not obvious to you, then what you can do is use the relationship. Cosine of 30 degrees is adjacent over hypotenuse, which in this case is going to be um, Vx, whatever that side is, divided by the hypotenuse, which is 100 meters per second. And then you can rearrange that to get Vx equals 100 meters per second cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, so um, if that's unfamiliar to you, then you should definitely go through the reasoning a few times. Um, but once you have done several of these, then it'll be very quick to recognize that um, the bottom side of this triangle is 100 cosine 30, and the right side is going to be 100 meters per second times sine of 30 degrees. Okay, so you can just plug those into a calculator and get the two numbers. Okay, so from that point on, we want to um, take an inventory of what we know in the x and the y direction. Okay, so the initial velocity in the x direction we figured out is going to be 100 meters per second times cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, um, and uh, if you plug that in to a calculator, I should have had my calculator ready, but I didn't, so let me get that ready. So 100 times cosine of 30 degrees, um, you get 86, um, 0.6 meters per second. Okay. Um, the acceleration in the x direction is zero, which means that the final velocity will be the same. Um, we don't know delta t yet. And the thing that we ultimately want to find is delta x, so we don't know that either. All right, so let's consider the y direction. Well, viy is going to be 100 meters per second times sine of 30, which is just 50 meters per second. Okay. The acceleration in the y direction is going to be negative 10 meters per second squared. The final velocity we don't know. The um, delta t we don't know. Um, and the delta y, we do know that's going to be negative 20 meters because again, the ball is landing lower than where it started. Okay, so we want to then solve for delta t. Well, we do have an equation that has initial velocity, acceleration, and delta y in it. That's going to look like this. Delta y equals one half a y delta t squared plus the initial velocity in the y direction times delta t. Um, so if we start plugging things in, we have negative 20 meters on the left equals one half times negative 10 meters per second squared times delta t squared plus 50 meters per second times delta t. So this is sort of the worst case scenario because we have a term with delta t squared, a term with delta t, and a term with no delta t's, which means we have to use the quadratic. No one's a huge fan of the quadratic, but it is a tool that you have seen multiple times and you should be able to do. Um, and so essentially plugging it into the, um, you know, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared, etc. Um, we need to know what a, b, and c are. So a is the part that is by the delta t squared, so that'll be negative 5 meters per second squared. b is going to be 50 meters per second. And c, when we move it to the other side, will be 20 meters. Okay, so we just plug that in to the quadratic formula. So delta t is going to be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. All right, so negative 50 um, plus or minus 
the square root of b squared, which is going to be 2,500, minus 4ac. Well, a times c is negative 100. 4 of that is 400, so I'll get 2,900 inside the square root, all over 2a, which is negative 10. Okay, so if I plug um, square root of 2,900 into my calculator, then this part is going to be um, 53.9. So then the two answers that I get are either going to be negative 50 plus or minus um, 53.9 all over negative 10. So if I go with the um, plus, then I get 3.9 divided by negative 10, so I get negative 0.39 seconds. Or if I go with minus, then I get 103.9 divided by um, 10, so that's going to be 10.4 seconds. Okay, so the quadratic formula, as it always does, gave us two answers, and we have to figure out which one's right. So one is a small negative number, one is a you know reasonable positive number. So what you don't want to do is just pick one that um, you like the sign of. You should actually reason through what's happening. So the way that we can interpret the negative number is um, if this cannonball had actually started um, behind where it started, um, then the negative number is when it would have passed ground level um, and then entered the same projectile motion it was in anyway. Okay, so clearly that number is not the correct one to use. The one we want to use is the one that's at the positive 10 seconds. Okay, so once we decide that that is the um, solution that makes sense in this case, we want to plug that in for our delta t. And we now know the initial velocity and the delta t, so we can figure out delta x. So delta x equals 1 half ax delta t squared plus the initial velocity in the x direction times delta t. The acceleration in the x direction is zero, so this term is zero, um, which then leaves us with the initial velocity, 86.6 .6 meters per second times delta t, which is 10.4 seconds. And if I plug that into a calculator, 86.6 um, .6 times 10.4, then I'm going to get 900 meters. Okay, so the scanner ball goes 900 meters before hitting the ground, um, and that's the solution to the problem. Okay, so um, having to do the quadratic formula is definitely a worst case scenario. Um, you should not expect me to be giving you problems like that on an exam. Um, but I think for homework problems, that's perfectly fine. For discussion problems, I think that makes sense. So um, you know, I'm going to try to be reasonable about what you know, makes sense to solve. But you can make up your own projectile motion problems that are very similar to this, where we know any combination of things. So maybe we know how far it goes, and you want to know what angle it, it launches. Or maybe we know um, how far it goes and what angle it launches at, but we don't know the speed. Or maybe we know um, some other combination. right? So um, you could also set up one where you want to know how high the cannonball hits on a wall, rather than knowing um, how far it goes over a flat plane. Um, and so there's a lot of different combinations, um, probably far too many combinations, but um, essentially you can come up with situations where you might know any of the information and need to solve for some of the others.